right now, what we're building with our internet surveillance and location tracking is the architecture of oppression. As our lives get further thrust into the digital realm during this quarantine period, what we need more than ever is robust digital security to protect the increasing activity that we're doing online, whether it's our work that needs to be secured or the private communication with our loved ones. But unfortunately, the internet is not nearly private enough. Is it possible to take back the internet and try to preserve some private space in our digital lives? That's a problem that Adam Back's company has been trying to solve. I chatted with him at the Satoshi Roundtable this year about the ways that private satellites and the leasing of satellites can help decentralize the internet. We're here at the Satoshi Roundtable. I'm with the CEO of Blockstream, Adam Back. Thank you so much for chatting with me. Thanks for having me on. So I wanted to chat with you about the Blockstream satellite service. There's a myth that you guys sent satellites up into space. That's not actually no, how it works, so right? That's uh, important to understand because big like geostationary satellites are expensive. They cost right. about a quarter of a billion dollars. Is that all? Yeah, so <laughs> that's, that's the satellite and then another quarter billion to launch it because they're heavy too. So what we do is we lease bandwidth from existing satellite providers. It's an additional piece of infrastructure for making the Bitcoin blockchain available to, to more people and with less reliance on regular internet connections. Mm -hmm. If you do run a, a full node or connect your computer to um, the Bitcoin blockchain, it advertises to the internet and to your ISP that you're a Bitcoin user. Mm -hmm. So other nodes on the Bitcoin network can see your IP address and that's also not good for your privacy. The satellite's quite good because it's broadcast and receive only. Mm -hmm. So there is no uh, footprint identifying you, your location, whether or not you're running a full node. So people are getting data from this satellite, but they're not transmitting any data back right. to it. Yeah, it's read only. And the other side of things is that it's helpful for freedom of speech. The first thing that countries seem to do when there is a revolution or political unrest, particularly less democratic countries, is to turn off the internet, even to turn off uh, GSM, cell phone service, SMS service. One of the things you need to, to get by, obviously, in, in, in a dramatic situation, is money that works. But the problem is, if you do use Bitcoin, you need an internet connection. So the satellite kind of is, a, is one of the building blocks to reconstructing that, which is now you can still receive Bitcoin, and you can do so in a much more private way. So advertising to you know, the local area that you're using Bitcoin could be risky in this kind of situation. But if you can do so with very strong privacy, then that's an, a tactical advantage. Mm -hmm. So I think it's part of the, the fabric of generally making uh, Bitcoin more robust and resilient. And people tend to look at Bitcoin as um, a hedge against geopolitical instability, other than um, you know, shutting off the internet, they might do some quite deep packet inspection and you know figure out who's saying what politically. And by packet inspection you mean that they're actually putting probes on internet connections right. and figuring out what data is being sent. So for example if the government decides to ban Bitcoin they right. could be inspecting what data is being sent and right. saying well they're using Bitcoin and right. um, that's that's very dangerous for people. Right of course that doesn't give you the ability to send a transaction it's just to receive. The important thing is receiving is, is the bulk data that's you know gigabytes per month. It's quite hard to do that with um, sort of more private, low bandwidth technologies. And so to send a transaction is much smaller. Other than broadcasting Bitcoin transactions and blocks, we made an API to enable application programmers to send their own messages. They might need to broadcast periodically the Bitcoin price or some other application data in their local currency. Some people yeah. are using it to send newspaper articles, headlines right. to places where there's internet censorship. There are a couple of different uh, social media interactions where people have got a satellite dish and connected it to a Twitter bot mm -hmm. that relays the messages. Another type of uh, use case is just general um, robustness for businesses. So, um, and mining is a special case of that. If you get in, in a region that gets cut off from the internet and it has some mining that's local, you might not notice. Yeah. Like you might continue and think that Bitcoin is working and that you receive money, but the rest of the network is continuing without you. There are times when countries have been kicked off the internet for half a day and things like that. Wow. So you want to have redundant internet connections for yeah. that reason. And also as a, as a business, like a payment processor or an exchange or something like that, you are quite reliant on having 
a reliable internet connection, somebody could try to hack your internet connection, you know, create a denial of service, hack the router. So having the satellite as a redundant connectivity would warn you that's happening. If somebody's sort of modifying the traffic coming to you to remove block announcements, and you get something that contradicts that from the satellite, you can verify it. And I think it's interesting for privacy for miners, I guess, if they can, you know, if they're operating in an area where it's frowned on to be doing mining at all. I hadn't thought of that, but that's a, a use case that it, they could benefit from. Another thing is sometimes you have uh, very cheap power, but it's cheap because it's remote and yeah. there's nothing there. Like there's no town, there's no right. internet, there's no phone lines. There's no running water, so you'll have people that will, you know, set up some kind of um, farm in a situation like that, or maybe containerized to make use of the cheap power, but then, like, what are they going to do for internet? So the satellite can help that. To receive it, you need the satellite equipment. You just have a small USB stick, which costs about $15, and that converts analog to digital, and then the signal processing is done in software. Um, on a, on a small computer, like a, a Rock 64. It's a kind of faster Raspberry Pi, basically. A Raspberry Pi is not enough for the application. Oh, okay. Um, and so the whole equipment, if you bought it new, might be $100. You can reuse a, satellite, a regular satellite dish. It works off of 45 centimeter mm -hmm. dishes. Um, so that, that's all in the aim of reducing the cost, increasing access. You talked before about the ability with regular internet for it to be filtered and perhaps some in information to be filtered out. Perhaps you're not getting the accurate representation of, of where the block is at. Um, right. Is it possible for the information to be corrupted in the same way on the Blockstream satellite service? Well, that's an interesting question. Because you're adding a piece of infrastructure which is in itself you know, somewhat centralized, it's mm -hmm. operated by Blockstream. We actually own and control the ground stations, and then we're relying on satellite mm -hmm. service providing companies to do it. So people would, I think, be right to say, well, I shouldn't, you shouldn't trust anything, right? You don't right. trust Verify, so don't trust Blockstream either, right? Yeah. And so I think the answer there is that you, you can still cross-check it. It doesn't cost much to verify, but it's certainly quite interesting in the balance of power with Bitcoin. That also is a decentralizing factor because you get competition. Right. I think there's a kind of uh, macro decentralization. More macro redundancy is, is useful for sort of surviving network outages and political disruption. I think that we're getting closer and closer to that redundancy that you're talking about where we have all of these little things that don't trust them, don't right. trust that it's going to be fail-proof, but when you add it all together, it really makes a very robust, secure network. There's some resiliency in our satellite uplinks as well. So because we have multiple um, ground stations with dishes, we chose the, the satellite service providers so that the ground stations could see each other's satellites. It's got most of the world's surface covered. If the internet connection failed at the west uh, satellite uplink, it would continue to run as long as it had power because it would receive the Bitcoin data from the other satellite. For too long we've had power centralized in a, in a few hands and I feel that technology has taken us to a place now where things are, are really exciting. More and more power is in the hands of the individual. There's certainly room for many more applications to be decentralized. People are also quite reliant on YouTube. There are people who have been deplatformed through no particular fault of their own, just that uh, you know, there's some kind of political agenda mm -hmm. or policy you know, election year you right. know, when they start to, s to censor people with different views depending on who the, the owner of the company, how their political views are. Mm -hmm. So it makes it hard to rely on those platforms for uh, free speech. That's why I love platforms like Library. It's a way for people to put content on the internet and it can't ever get taken down. It's right. decentralized. That's sort of decentralization for the content where Bitcoin is decentralization that replaces PayPal and things like that, right. which, which have also exercised quite arbitrary mm -hmm. policies in suspending people's accounts without notice and you know, if disrupting businesses that mm -hmm. are doing perfectly legal things. Laws and regulations lag behind what people feel uh, individually for society. For example, coffee was outlawed for a very long period of time. What? So was heard, it really? Yeah. <laughs> so if society believes that something is perfectly reasonable and people should have free choice in it, 
it oftentimes takes the legal system and regulators decades mm -hmm. to catch up with what people expect. Absolutely, so. and it's sort of uh, Moxie's argument about how we shouldn't ever live in a uh, perfectly uh, legal society where everyone's obeying every law, right. because it's only by breaking the bad laws that we change things and we evolve. Technology innovation is typically um, building things without permission, without you know, upfront asking permission. So. And Bitcoin is in this space too, right? What do you think about organisations like ICANN? This rather insidious centralising force where you have to go and get permission to have a website, to permission to get a domain name. I made a proposal about domain names many years ago before Bitcoin. I was also a little annoyed about the centralising nature of it, that the centralised party could basically seize your domain name yeah. arbitrarily. They seized the Silk Road domain name, for example, right? right. But they also seize domain names because you know a big company asserts that they have a copyright on it. And you're like, what, well, that's my surname. Why, yeah. why are you closing down my site that right. I've had for my you know, family email for the last yeah. few years or something? What Bitcoin is showing is that the best uh, form of property enforcement is for you to have like direct bearer control of it so that you know if they want to seize some bitcoins they're going to have to come and ask the person who owns them they can't go to a bank or service provider and say well you know when he wakes up tomorrow morning he'll find that his bank balance right. is empty they start to think decentralized when it affects them <laughs> right. and you know seeing getting your paypal account shut down for no good reason is certainly a way to to wake up and think oh, this is this is not good but it's certainly a great improvement for society that uh, you have a way to opt out of that and take more control yourself some people don't see the value of bitcoin in day-to-day -day transactions I see it because, number one, I want to take power away from the system that is very centralised, that can seize funds. And number two, I don't want my data being collected by the banks, by the credit card companies, them knowing right. every single transaction that I'm doing. That's not a place where we want to get to in society where everything we do is known, but we're very close to that it's point true, right now. Yeah. It's getting worse and that there was no societal discussion about whether people would find it acceptable to add more tracing to all payments. Right. And because more things are happening online in electronic form, the default is they're all traced to a very great degree. And that's actually, you know, it wasn't a conscious choice. It's a shift in uh, privacy norms without any opt-in. So I think it's, you know, it's certainly reasonable for people to say, well, they would like uh, electronic cash rather than electronic bank accounts. It does hold people back. If they feel that their internet browsing is being monitored, right. they will modify what they're searching for. And that's something that Snowden's talked a lot about, that we didn't opt into this system, it just gradually evolved over time and now we're at this place where it's become this normalized part of society. Right. Um, and in terms of like privacy and transactions, where do you see Bitcoin going? One of the changes recently is uh, Schnorr and Taproot. Different bits of technology have improved different aspects of privacy. So this one reduces fingerprinting so that it's harder to tell from the transaction what type of wallet it came from, or even to distinguish, let's say, a lightning channel setup from a regular payment, from a multi-sig payment. So they all look the same. There's definitely room for more privacy. When I first got involved with Bitcoin, it was because of the privacy things that mm -hmm. I felt that it, it was great that somebody had solved the uh, double spend problem and made a, a live system that was decentralized, but the privacy was not great. Right. Um, and another thing that I think would be interesting to see in Bitcoin midterm is confidential transactions, which is a way to hide the values in the transaction. So you can still see which address is receiving coins, but you no longer know how many coins. We have it running in a layer two in a liquid sidechain. Maybe in the future that would eventually find its way into Bitcoin with the right trade-offs and some more right. optimization. Bitcoin is, as you said, looking at security first, so it's hard to see Bitcoin itself directly adopt a technology which is immature. Like it's got technology risk, there's risk it might get broken mm -hmm. cryptographically, or it hasn't been tested very much. And so the way that the Bitcoin layer system has enabled that is like Lightning is able to operate using layer one without presenting a new risk to layer one. Because it's just, you know, if somebody 
found a flaw in Lightning, it wouldn't affect the underlying Bitcoin storage. You know, there is definitely room for more privacy features, a more privacy-centric sidechain, for example. This has been really great and I appreciate your time. Thanks so much. Thank you. A huge shout out to all the members of NBTV and I really hope you've been enjoying all the extended versions of these interviews I've been putting out for you. If you'd like to become a member of NBTV and get access to all kinds of exclusive content like extended interviews, live streams, etc., then please sign up at naomibrockwell.com slash memberships. If you found this video interesting or useful, then don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Thank you so much for watching.